Welcome, James. I'd like to know, and can you tell our audience who you are and what you'd like to discuss today? Hey, Dan. Uh, I'm James. I'm the founder of MegaCat Studios, and we're here to talk about Ronio's Tale, a game we have live on Kickstarter for the NES. Cool. Ronio's Tale. Like, uh, it's Ronius. Ro- How do you pronounce that again? Ronio. Ronio. Yeah, it's a... I want to say it's like a derivative of like a Spanish like hero name that one of the writers had had kind of become committed to during the the creative process of coming up with the game. Okay. So what is your role in in the uh the process of these games? Well, every game's different. I think kind of like um kind of like most game studios, everyone wears several hats. You know, mm-hmm. everyone's involved with start to finish, so ideation and creation down to we're all bug testing together and making sure everything ships and goes out on time. Uh, in this case, Ronio's Tale was made by Kunji Studio, and we are the publisher in the project. So normally part of a, our role of being a good publishing partner is helping with distribution, marketing. Um, it's helping to go through kind of product design, like how much content the game has and how many levels and uh, how difficult the product is. Uh, in some cases, we get to be really collaborative and really hands-on. And influence the project and then sometimes the projects come to us already ready for release and then we get to just take the take the lead on marketing initiative so with Ronio's tale we started pretty early in the project and we were luckily luckily able to like positively influence the creation of the game mm-hmm. okay and um so what i'm just curious like how did you get into the path that you're on today you know, most of us met through <clears throat> collecting and trading like, retro games. Mm-hmm. So I think some of my um, closest friends and groomsmen actually met through Nintendo Age like 15 oh, years yeah. ago, something mm-hmm. like that. The forum. Yeah. So um, many moons ago, we all met through there. And I think like uh, like many people who make games, like one day you just decide you want to try making a game. And next thing you know, you're you're Googling tutorials and asking questions on NES dev. Yeah. And, uh, you know, fast forward six years later and there's, you know, 30 of us that are all making games, some capacity full time. And we do some of our own games. We publish games for other folks. And then we uh, do a lot of games for other larger companies. That way we're able to balance out, you know, how much guaranteed committed revenue we have that allows us to experiment on some of the projects that we want to bring to life. Cool. Yeah. Um, So does that mean you've made games too for yourself? Yeah, so I'm not very good, but um, yeah, we've all we've all touched uh, each side of it. You know, I, I think it took me um, a solid day and a half to draw an animated bat a few years ago when I was first learning basics of pixel art. Mm-hmm. And then, um, you know, some of our more skilled designers could probably do that same task in like 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> sure. But um, but I mean, I think there's a lot of value though in being able to understand and relate to each phase of like the creation process. Mm-hmm. So at the very least, I can relate to it, and I've given a number of um, like boot camp detox for getting started. So I'm quite good at the basics, and um, I think just naturally going through the process as many times as we have, we're actually coming up on our 60th game pretty soon. Oh wow! Um, so lots of um, each project, you learn something new, and you, know, sure. you get to test out something you learned last time, and you know see see how these old tools you created can be iterated on, and um, you know, we're always working on how to improve internal processes and how we can, you know, make those um, smoother journeys to make better games. Yeah, I know um, you mentioned NES devs and uh, I've been on there a lot, but I, I don't really make games. You know, I've tried to dabble it. It's kind of hard, actually. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, especially NES. It's just like trying to figure out that whole. I know NES Maker exists now and it's a little easier, but. Um, I like just going to NES devs and just seeing what people are up to. You know, it, it, have you found anybody there that you work with or is that? Yeah, we have a number of full-time team members that we met through NES dev. Oh, cool. Yeah, it, it's it's definitely like the, I don't think there's been three or four communities that we were really close with early and <clears throat> we've met friends and team members through throughout. And that would have been um, 
used to be and include Nintendo Age, uh, Nestev, and then the uh, like our retro gaming subreddit. We had a lot of people that just come to our website too, and in many cases where we've met people that we know their screen name for ten years, we never met them in person, and they come up to us at Magfest or PAX East, and oh by the way, I'm uh, Tokumaru. We've been talking for ten years, or whatever mm-hmm. it might be, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's it's pretty it's pretty interesting, but I think that's a pretty common thing today in like the digital world where you like meet people on online and then one day you run into them in person and it's this, this interesting like third wall moment yeah yeah i can imagine so what what led you to um this newest game so we did not make Ronio's tale uh we were the publisher but one of the developers in the project was a friend of ours just from the retro gaming community and uh he just really loves and was inspired by Solomon's Key and Kiko Cubicle and the Adventures of Lolo series. I think he's always wanted to make like a commercial um, NES game. I think he's had a dozen, when I say like false starts, where he'd jump into a project with a group of folks and everyone starts off really enthusiastic and full of momentum. And then slowly they get distracted with um, work responsibilities and family life and other projects. So in this one, he, I think he approached it as no matter what, he's going to finish what he starts and to find a, a more serious, uh, committed team to work with. So he ended up linking up with a handful of folks that founded Kanji Studios. And uh, they've been awesome to work with. Um, so Valdir was a dev that introduced us. But um, one of their team leads and producers, Raphael, has also been in games for a number of years. I think most of the, the team actually works in the games industry, not in retro, but just in mobile and PC console. So they're definitely familiar with what it takes to finish a game and, you know, and the kind of intrinsic game sensibilities, you know, not just production, but, you know, creating a fun game loop and, you know, phases of production that allow you to make something more fun. So they've been awesome to work with, but uh, Valdir, the dev is the one that introduced us. Okay. So as um, you said, you're the owner of Megacat Studios, the CEO or whatever. Yeah, I mean, founder is usually the way I would founder? describe it. But yeah, okay. it's like the, it's really this group of us. We, we kind of all use the same, the same title. And when we first started, it was really just everyone doing everything. Um, you know, we definitely have a much bigger vision now that we're we're deeper on in the journey. But in the end, it's like we're still just a group of folks who happen to love retro gaming. Sure, <laughs> that all met through the same kind of message boards that um, just really want to continue to provide more value to folks that do this. And especially in the publishing side, I think that the, what makes that really interesting for us and what we're really excited by is the fact that as we become better as a publishing partner, it facilitates better games to, to be made because now with the extra capital and, and uh, process improvement and kind of smoothness of development, like the, the game devs and the game teams can really focus on the, part of the project that they're particularly skilled at and we can help add value with some of the things that we're skilled at with distribution and marketing and helping to be an extension of their team with things like art and music and anything that helps right. get it all packaged up and feeling fun. So as the founder, what do you look for in uh, game devs to, you know, to decide on whether you want to publish the game or not? You know, we have a, a little bit of a roundtable process where there's a number of us that will play the game and cast a vote. We have some like one to five, uh, I'm going to say subcategories that we evaluate and submit and discuss. Um, we do turn down more games than we publish these days. Uh, mm-hmm. There was a time very early where we were willing to publish any game that had uh, a, the right level of production value. But something that's interesting with games is that sometimes games that don't have a very high production value are just really fun <laughs> and there's always exceptions. So I guess as we've, um, we've evolved, it really just comes down to what our other commitments are and how much time we have. And if we think we can add enough value to that project to, to make it work. Yeah. That's probably, that's a good philosophy. I think, uh, I mean, value is always like something I look for it, just being a business owner myself. It's like, how much value does this bring? That kind of thing. But it's also like the, um, the time it takes to make any game, uh, not just like retro games, but even more so with cartridge-based mm-hmm. games, it's just such a serious amount of, of time commitment and like dedication to uh, to finish them. We just never want to sign on to be anyone's game publisher if we're not going to be able to help really crush it for them. Right. 
Right. So let's talk about uh, Ronio's Tale. Have you? I, I assume you've played it. I have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what do you think makes it special? You know, I, I love um, like the basic pick up and play capacity of 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 these puzzle games. Like if you sit at a convention, and we've we've done this prior to COVID, and you have someone sit down and start jamming on Ronio's Tale. You don't actually have to be a retro game super fan or like a puzzle expert to enjoy it. So there's there's something nice about not having like a deep pitch to set somebody up to play a game. And then from a difficulty standpoint, you know, it, it gets pretty hard as you get through the game. So it has like a an interesting position that appeals to super casual fans and, and fans that are pretty pretty seriously uh, skilled at retro gaming, which is not as not as easy as it seems. We've had some folks send us games that are crazy hard and um, it makes it harder. Uh, it really appeases like those retro hard like uh, game players, but mm-hmm. is like almost unplayable for the casual, the casual um, pick up and have fun. You know, cause I think there's a number of folks that collect and play retro games that are, that are like over 30 years old. They have very little free time and they have like big aspirations of like playing games, but very, <laughs> very low likelihood they're going to be able to play everything start to finish. So having something that there is a, a stickiness when you can pick it up is it, just good for everybody. It makes that makes that kind of um, entire user journey just so much more fun if it's bearable from the beginning. Sure. Yeah, I agree. I mean, and also I think there's something to be said about something that's balanced rather than just hard to be hard sake. Like, you know, you oh, take yeah. a game like Super Mario Brothers and the way it progressively gets harder as you get through it, although it's ne- never impossible to get through, you know, a Mario game. I think that's a good level of, you know, difficulty. But yeah, it, yeah, it's definitely um, a ba- balancing act throughout development because something that's unique to the retro gaming audience is at the end of the game cycle, we'll have folks who are like hardcore retro game players play the game. Uh, and this goes for any game and you'll people who are just cheering at the top, the game's way too easy and it's no problem because they can beat the game in 15 minutes. And we went through this with uh, one of our other games. It's pretty similar called little Medusa mm-hmm. where like the, the game designer and that project Zach can actually beat the whole game in under 15 minutes. And the average play time for like a, a kind of casual, but regular retro players, probably like 45 minutes. And for people who are not as casual that, or maybe more casual, it's probably an hour or two of someone replaying to, to get through the game. And that's a pretty big uh, big range on the sliding scale, like 15 minutes to two hours. And, and it was really a long and uh, I want to say like challenging journey to determine exactly how to balance that project. So Ronio's right. Tale is, is similar because you know I, I could see it being a two-hour uh, feet for someone to get through and I could see someone who's just really good at it and has played through it a number of times crushing right. the game in 30 minutes uh, which is kind of indicative of like all the all the NES games like I have friends who are almost able to complete Mega Man 3 in 25 minutes straight through and they're not you know they're not attracting an audience at a convention they're just really good at Mega Man 3 sure. you know? so it's a <laughs> I think finding that sweet spot's important yeah yeah as an aside, I'm I'm a, a speedrunner at Mega Man 2. I, I get through it pretty quick, but I'm not as good as a lot of people out there. But <laughs> what's your best time? Oh, it was like I think it was 17 minutes, something like that. Just, yeah, I don't. I, yeah, something like that. I have a I have a friend I grew up with, Bill, who can basically play Mega Man X like almost blindfolded, like straight through. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was one of the few games he had growing up. And I remember before we knew the term speedrunning being like 10 and we would just like watch Bill play Mega Man X. Like he's so good at it. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've done that as a, as a kid. Um, you know, Mario was out when I was a kid and uh, I used to, I got so good at the game that I would blindfold myself and get through the levels. And I, yeah. I never, Totally beat it, but I got to level seven, you know? Yeah, it's awesome. So, yeah. Um, anyway, <laughs> back to the uh, the game at hand. Um, I wanted to ask you... Let me see here. I had a few questions here that I'd written down real quick. Oh, so besides the game at hand, um, I've played a few of the other games like The Meeting and Creepy Brawlers. And um, what else have I played? Log Jammers and Justice Duel. 
Um, what is your favorite game that you guys have published? You know, it's hard to pick your favorite child. You yeah, I hear you. Like, I hear you. Uh, <laughs> there's like unique things about each, like uh, like Justice Duel is an example. It's very, very simple. It's basically Joust with presidents, but it's four player. And there, you know, less than 1% of the NES library worked for four player. So it's a ton of fun to play for couch co-op. And it had, introduces some unique mechanics that makes that couch co-op session pretty fun. But as a single player game, it just doesn't really hold up. Yeah. Uh, Creepy Brawlers is easily one of my favorite, but there's like a unique player archetype that like loves punch out that would love creepy brawlers. Something I've noticed even with punch out and we used to run a ton of these retro free play areas at conventions. A lot of people will sit down to play punch out. And they can't get past like the third character. Mm-hmm. And that's probably similar for creepy brawlers because it's, it's punch out, which is slightly more difficult. Uh, but I guess if I'm choosing one in, in general, it's probably coffee crisis because of, you know, symbolically mm-hmm. kind of what it was to the, to the team and then just how many um, constant <laughs> hurdles and updates we had after working through um, working through the project. So it, it was such a, a long running learning experience for us because of the, the first game we made uh, on hardware. And it was the first game that we made for the sake of Genesis. It's the first game we ended up porting to and redeveloping for Xbox one and switch and PS4. And we actually just pushed a ton of updates last month. So we're kind of always supporting it. Oh, nice. Yeah, I want to play that. Well, I, that's one I haven't played yet, but it's one that looked really cool to me when you guys released it. So, Yeah, I'll, I'll send you some keys if you want to play it digitally. Oh, that'd be cool. That'd be cool. Thanks. Um, I have a question about Creepy Brawlers, though. Was that is that like a ROM hack of Power Punch 2? No, you know, I've had a lot of folks ask that. I think uh-huh. it's because of the alien. The alien like gives people these, like, uh, these like, ROM hack vibes, but it was uh, one of the longest development cycles we've had for an NES game. Mm-hmm. It was, it's everything's from scratch. We've never never had any ROM hacks. Okay. I figured that, but I thought I'd ask because a couple of people I've talked to too have said that. And it's like, well, I got you here. I might as well ask you about it. Yeah. I've had a lot of people email us about that too. Now, you know, what is it that you think was uh, striking that made you think of uh, Power Punch? Um, I think it's the way it played kind of. It has that yeah. feel to it. Hmm. So... Yeah, maybe it's different since I was in the kitchen when we were making it, but um, you know, I, I know that one of the big challenges we had, and we made a couple public commits to the CA65 like public repo, mm-hmm. was just fitting those giant background objects as sprites um, to make the game work, and it was just a, a real bear for us to to finish, and we packed every last little bite as you often do with these games. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but there's a couple like uh technical feats that we we really took advantage of in that game that I think, I think we did a great job on just getting as much content in as we did for that size. And it was such a, a fun game to work on too. I think movie monsters are so cool. Like you yeah. can put movie monsters in anything and have fun with it, but yeah, it's a cool um, idea for sure. There's a lot of like very flavorful animation packed into that game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I would say it's better than power punch too, by the way, <laughs> just so you just... <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm curious. So this, this podcast is usually about creatives and like our struggles and things like that. And I'm just wondering as a person who's a creative and works with creatives, what's the biggest hurdle you've had and how did you overcome it? Yeah. You know, I guess the biggest challenge that we've had is balancing. And this is why we ended up becoming game publishers um, is balancing out like community building and marketing activities with production because in gaming, you have this like broad sliding scale and like tech to art and games are unique in that they have to have both um, quite established and quite, and quite polished to make a fun product. That's going to have some kind of commercial success. Um, sometimes you don't measure the, the success of it in commercial sales. Sometimes it's about just uh, getting through that ceremony and getting it done. Sometimes it's about just having people play the games at conventions, but uh, for us, for, for our business and for a lot of independent devs, like you have to make money on the games to be able to do more of them and to be able to do it full time. So the hardest thing for us um, early days was to balance out the time and the processes and the the man hours and the effort it took to build build that community and also spend time building the games. And you know it's exactly what prompted us to start publishing other people's games. As we we were sitting at a convention it was pax east a few years ago i'm talking to some of our friends who also make homebrew games 
and just talking about, you know, unit sales and, you know, how we, how we talk about them and where people pick them up and kind of the changing landscape of them too, because you mentioned NES maker and there's, mm-hmm. a, there's always something um, new happening in NES maker. Like once a month, there's a new game. And prior to NES maker it was probably, probably once every six months, um, something like that. And that really high speed now and that lower barrier to entry, which is really exciting in my opinion, because it introduces a lot of fun game opportunity um, where you can really start to play with the game, the gameplay and the core game loops and sort of um, as much the higher barrier to entry of learning assembly, and which is its own uh, serious experience and art and craft to kind of like uh, invest your body into and like live there for a while. But we found out that we, you know, we probably sold more copies of some of our games than a lot of our friends combined. Um, and it had us naturally to start publishing other people's games because we, you know, being in the U S we have an advantageous opportunity to go to all these cool trade shows. Um, we, we set up a ton of these retro free play areas, you know, early years it was because we couldn't spend the $10,000 for each trade show to set up and get a big booth and staff it and do all those things. So we, we started bartering with a lot of these larger events on running and staffing their retro free play area. Hmm. It was also a great excuse for us to buy a ton of PVMs, but, um, you know, it, it eventually turned into this really great community hub where we'd meet a lot of other people that just shared this love for retro with us. And we met a lot of team members that way. Um, you know, folks who ended up hiring and working with full time and, and then there's a lot of people of every, every age and background, uh, come up to you at these events and just say like, I actually made an NES game or a Game Boy Advance game or a Super <laughs> Nintendo demo. 10 years ago and I've been sitting on it and uh, tons of other game companies too, folks from, you know, Epic and Riot and, and Atari just have been won- wondering what to do with their homebrew experiment. Because in many cases, the same thing that drove us into making these games for these consoles that inspired us to make games as a career. Um, it was kind of part of their bucket list too. Huh. So is, do you have any advice for people who are starting out making games if they want to be published? You know, I always ask everybody to just go to game jams, check them out and just make something. There's just so much value in finishing something that you start. You know, I think that the the biggest, biggest in general portfolio thing we can look at for anyone that's trying to get a job in games or trying to bring their game to anyone to publish is just making something, um, you know, mm-hmm. getting your hands dirty and bringing something to life start to finish. You, you learn so much um, about about yourself and about product design and development and serving community and building, building games that you can really only get through hands-on experience. Right. So just do it is kind of what you're saying. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, so one of the questions I ask all the time is, um, what do you wish you had known when you first started out? Yeah. You know, I guess, um, if I apply that personally, like not at like the mega cat global side, Mm -hmm. I guess what I, what I wish would have known when I started out, uh, it definitely would have been that back to the whole marketing and community building tool early. Mm. You should be building that at day zero. Like very first thing is like talking about it and letting people know it's, it's out there and you're, you're working on a thing. Um, you know, we, we often joke internally that, you know, we were, we were basically building out, processes um which is a funny way for us to rebrand the idea of like failing forward because <laughs> when you first start out all you do is make mistakes and learn making those mistakes to mm-hmm. bring it back and we had a we had a number of games that we ended up not announcing or like partially announcing and just not working on because um we would just have a eureka moment part way through or we'd we'd learn a brand new a brand new transformative thing for our design process or for you know how to how to really distill like uh, community feedback and turn it into action items because it's, it's not uncommon for people to describe very broadly um, what it is they want done and what they liked and didn't like about a game. And then that feedback ends up not being as useful as you hope because they're, they're really commenting on um, animation, but what they really mean is like timing, right. Or, or, oh, yeah. or, or maybe they're really, you know, zooming in on sound design and using it in like a broad term, and our sound designer is like racking his head. And what they're really talking about is like 
like a balancing in the sound design or, or maybe there's one or two incredibly annoying sound effects that just sound crazy and kind of ruin the whole thing. So it's, right. it's like, uh, there's just so many little nooks and crannies at each project that we've, uh, we've learned and, and changed on that. It's like, uh, number one would be all the community building should be first and foremost, whenever you're, you're committed to the game and you're going to get married to the game and you're doing it, let people know and start getting some feedback early. But you know, outside of that, on the production side, it's like, you know, just getting your hands dirty is essential. I, I think there's so much value in even an artist understanding technical limitations and basics of development and then vice versa. Like some of our best engineers, you know, are, are pretty, pretty comfortable with um, you know, broad art sensibilities too. like just having some awareness and knowledge of color theory and lighting and all these other things that bring a game to life is uh it's just so valuable to look through those different lenses. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, especially the, the community thing. I think that, you know, no matter what kind of creative you are, it's good to build community, right? Like that's like the oh, yeah. first thing you should be doing. Um, <clears throat> so as far as Ronio's tale goes, um, well, what would you like to tell people about the game? Well, I think that the, the most fun you can have with Ronio's Tale is playing solo by yourself, um, just kind of getting lost in the simplicity, the difficulty of like a well-timed puzzle game. Um, some folks have never played Lolo's or Solomon's Key or Kickle Cubicle, and we're able to introduce them to this really fun like subgenre the first time. Mm-hmm. We had that same experience with Little Medusa, and easily one of my favorite things about that game is that we were introduced to something we eventually called the Cat Dad Moment. And it's where we'd be at these trade shows. We'd have a dad come over or mom with one of their kids and say, oh, look, I had one of these when I grew up. And then 35 minutes later, the dad's like perched all the way forward of the chair trying to beat like the fourth level. Uh-huh. And uh, and the kids are kind of equally immersed and sucked in because it's, it's, um, it's a whole different style of gameplay compared to like the frenetic action adventure like Fortnite that you might, mm-hmm. you might get into. So it's, uh, it's, it's perfect for that type of experience. And I think a lot of the folks that uh, enjoy and play and, and purchase modern, like modern indie retro and, and homebrew projects, I think they're really looking for like a quality, short, high polish experience that has a little bit of something new for the first time, a little bit of something old they can relate to. Mm-hmm. And I think Ronio does that really well. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, so my first impression, you sent me a copy of it. And my first impression was, it reminded me of Lolo. Like, Lolo is one of my favorite puzzle games of all time. And, you know, I own all three. And it's just like, it reminded me of that, but with the element of you cannot go back, right? You can't right. go back over what you've, you've done. Um, I'm curious, though, is, is the game completely finished, the one that I've been playing? or The one you're playing is pretty old, actually. I think it's, um, it's probably six months old. Mm-hmm. We actually have a big update coming out even this coming week, but it's been updated every month um, from a total percentage basis. I think the game is around 70% complete, but, but the, the ROM you have on the prototype cartridge is probably from March. Okay. Something like that. And, uh, you know, as we moved ahead, we decided to freeze the content at that point for the prototype. because so it was pretty stable. There's still some, some obvious bugs, pretty stable. And we had some, some aspirations of how much content we wanted to fit in. We knew there mm-hmm. were going to be some regressions as we started packing that in. So we kind of froze that build to make that Kickstarter prototype version and then got right back to right back to work on working sure. the Ronios. Okay. Yeah. Cause I mean, I was going to do, I, I plan on doing, a, you know, a review of it of some kind, but, and I know I'm, I'm keeping mindful that it is a demo and a, you know, a pre-production uh, version you know, and I just had a few like little things that I'm like, oh, I wish this was different. You know, like um, I, I would say the uh, every time you die and you got to go through that whole uh, story screen again. Maybe oh, yeah. That, yeah. That kind of thing. If it, it, it takes press, a little press to skip is like a godsend in games. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I agree. In fact, um, I can send you a, a new ROM that we're going to have in a big update now that uh, has that included a number of other fixes. Cool. Yeah. And I, like I said, I was going to, you know, let people be aware that what I'm reviewing is not the final version. And I figured that these bugs would be worked out. So 
anyway, yeah, I just wanted to make sure. I, I really appreciate it. And just in general, the reason we do the prototype cartridges and the demo ROMs is to collect and curate uh, feedback from folks right. like this because sometimes it's really obvious, like the press to skip. Uh, and then sometimes people will send you these like really great insights that, you know, you really benefit from these unique perspectives. Mm -hmm. uh, and then sometimes you see games too easy or too hard and we can make a couple other earlier balancing adjustments. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I know like one of my other things was I probably spent a good 20 minutes on level three where you get the ghost power and I couldn't figure out for the life of me what that thing did. <laughs> and I know, you know, you have instructions or whatever and that, yeah. that'd be helpful. But um, that was one little thing that I was like, what does this do? But that's kind of the fun of those kind of puzzle games is you're trying to figure out what does each thing do and how do you use it? You know, it, it's something that's unique to retro games too in that like um, not everything has explicitly like given you like this hand-holding moment. Mm -hmm. You know, whenever we balance the difficulty in like a modern retro game that's not on a cartridge, um, there's way more integrated explanation, usually two or three layers of it because uh, like I say, the, the more hardcore retro player is a lot more forgiving for like going on that hunt and journey and trying to figure things out and solving that puzzle. And like the, I think it's something that's a little bit lost in, um, in like modern games because they, they definitely want to retain users with that first time experience and not, not make it so challenging that they bounce out and close the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, like I was saying earlier, uh, talking about Mario, for instance, like the way that that game is set up, it's such a, it's set up really nicely to with a learning curve in mind. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And um, and I do think that that Ronio's Tale has that as well. Um, it walks you through the first level, and you kind of it's easier. You know, I think I died like four or five times just trying to figure out what to do. But yeah, it it doesn't hold your hand, but it's it levels up in difficulty fairly naturally yeah I, i'm glad you think that because it's uh, it's one of the things we're making some of the bigger changes on is the difficulty balancing and i think after world 2 uh it has a couple big jumps with some of the abilities but i think the the final package with the instruction manual and a couple small twists to the integrated tutorial it's going to be just right yeah yeah is is there anything else you want people to know about that game no, it's actually Kunji Studios' first commercial release. Mm -hmm. so Kunji Studios, the game that uh, the folks that made Ronio's Tale, they're the top-down writer of the story and creator. Um, we're really just there to help uh, support marketing and community building. And, you know, we helped a little bit on the, um, you know, making sure localization and everything else was appropriate in the line. But outside of that, this is definitely a Kunji Studio project that we're just there to help push the signal up on and share it with folks that, already playing like other games that we, we made. Cool. And there's no like Kickstarter or anything. It's just, you guys are going to publish it when it's ready. Actually live on Kickstarter right now. Oh, it is live on Kickstarter. Good. Yeah, it has a, I think it has another two weeks or so left on the Kickstarter. We actually met our goal in about six hours. Um, hmm. So, so it definitely was well received. And, and I think, um, I think it's going to be one of our more successful Kickstarters yet too. There's awesome. a couple of reasons why, like the game is definitely fun and good, and that that's been well received. A lot of people have really enjoyed the demo. But aside from that, too, this is like our like our fifth Kickstarter, and each one has been its own lesson learned. And there's it's such a vibrant community right now for like aftermarket retro folks that I don't think you can put a game up that doesn't come close. I think it's cool just from how alive the community is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, are there any plans to put this out on anything besides the NES? We have some stretch goals that are part of the crowdfunding campaign mm -hmm. and include porting it to Switch and modern consoles. Uh, if we don't hit those, it's probably going to be limited to PC and cartridge. Yeah. Uh, but it, might have a, it seems like we're, we're closing in right now on that Switch port. All right. So get out there and, and support this if you want to see it right. out there further. <laughs> yeah. Um, personally, what is your favorite retro game? Like any retro game? Yeah, go go along the whole canon of retro games. So first of all, I'm, I'm a Sega first person. I've, uh -huh. uh, I've had millions of arguments with our teammates because we have Super Nintendo people. We have plenty of Nintendo first super fans, but <clears throat> I grew up with the Sega. I'm a huge fan of... The, the uh, Genesis or...? Yeah, the Genesis, yeah. Okay. 
I'm a huge fan of Gunstar Heroes, uh, mm. Vector Man. You know, like, they're just such fun, easy to pick up, replayable projects. They they look beautiful. They're like late enough life cycle that they almost start to push that like uh, next gen of pixel art games. Mm-hmm. Vector Vector Man specifically is like a a technical work of art. All the physics they pulled off. There's just yeah, so much beautiful. cool stuff going on there. But uh, you know, I love uh, I love the Neo Geo too. I, I didn't start playing Neo Geo until I, I basically inherited a uh, Neo Geo and a cartridge from my buddy Gabe is one of our first artists. He had like mm-hmm. purchased a few of them that were broken to refurb and mod um, as a way to pay for the incredibly expensive consoles. And then, um, you know, after repairing a couple of these pretty ugly Neo Geos, we ended up making a deal and trading some stuff. And it, I got bit by the bug because at that point in my, in my collecting, I'd already... I've already gone through the paces on what I enjoyed for all 16-bit things, and it it kind of tickled that same spot in my my gameplay life. And there's just so much uh, so much fun content on the console. Yeah, on the Neo Geo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like the Neo Geo a lot. I can't say I've ever owned one, but I used to play it in the arcades all the time. I loved it, and yeah. um, I mean, I I have ways to play it, you know. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, <I> am. <laughs> uh, yeah, we ahead. actually have a we actually have a Neo Geo cabinet we got at the office that we had purchased from somebody on Craigslist a few years ago, and it had like like twenty games and a cabinet for like four hundred dollars. Oh wow! And uh, it was really great, really great value. And yeah, I originally bought it with the intent of us flipping it and using it as a way to go to another trade show or, or buying another arcade. And we ended up loving it so much um, that we, we use it to like settle settle arguments. Uh, figure out who's buying lunch. Like it's like um, it's definitely like a dedicated piece of our our like team now. And it's either the Neo Geo cabinet or uh, NBA Jam TE as our like go tos for for beating up four player arguments. And it's it's so easy to have fun with those games too because they're built for these like fifteen minute or less sessions of you just like hammering your friend. Right. So you just yeah. pull up like a a two person fighter and and that's whoever wins that's wins the argument. Yeah. That's great. You got it. Yeah. That's fantastic. Often, Oftentimes, when jammers do like um, when jammers oh, yeah. is like a mainstay for us, but you know, th- there's so many fun games. Um, you know, you can kind of, I think we have like one of those 161 and ones as one in one of the slots, so we mm-hmm. can kind of we kind of rule through the gamut after. But the fighting games are so good on the Neo Geo. Yeah, it's just like uh, it's like a pleasure to behold if you love pixel art. Right on. Yeah, I agree. I agree totally. I was blown away when I first saw the Neo Geo. It was, you know, coming from Nintendo or, or Genesis, and then the Neo Geo is like, it just blows your mind. Um, <clears throat> speaking of wind jammers, I know you guys have log jammers, which is, yeah. <laughs> I thought it was a pretty cool feat to like kind of put that onto an NES, that idea onto an NES cartridge. Yeah, you know, log jammers is easily one of my favorite personal projects too. So it was uh, inspired by wind jammers, and we'd have these wind jammers office sessions. And every year at MAGFest, we'd set up and we'd, we'd all compete and we'd all play. And we are like, you know, I wish we had... This is before when Jammers was uh, HD re-released mm-hmm. um, or, or had or even the sequel for that matter. And we are like, what if we had um, Wind Jammers, but there were some items and it was a little bit faster uh, and even even quicker rounds. And then we made the... We actually made the PC version first and then we made the NES version after, which was... Um, unnecessarily long because we made like the first version sold it learned a whole ton and three years later just remade it from scratch to make it look prettier and make it work better and um you know it's really well received we actually have log jammers tournaments uh, at a lot of the events we set up at and there's it's so easy to pick up and play because it's basically on the on the sliding scale of pong to wind jammers log jammers fits on like the higher upper end of um of depth but like has such a low barred entry where anybody can pick up and understand get this thing in the goal and um, it, it creates this fun moment where you don't have to be like a wind jammers like esports pro to play in a log jammers tournament and there's enough like quick high speed kind of chaos that sometimes you can slip one past someone who's really really uh inching up the scoreboard and you only have to have two out of three to win around so it it's a lot of fun to watch people play yeah i bet that would be a cool little tournament tournament game um so- so what about modern games? Are you into modern games at all? Yeah, I don't think anyone that does retro gaming doesn't also play some modern games. Mm-hmm. You know, recently I've been been flirting a lot with Hades 
I think the last uh, last couple of game nights, I've been just living in Hades and enjoying everything that game has to offer. But you know, I, I love Dead Cells. You know, I love uh, yeah. I love modern RPGs. I don't have the time to like dedicate myself to them, so instead, I enjoy those by proxy, watching people play them on Twitch. <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, but it's like you know, I I just um have to say that roguelikes are one of my favorite discoveries the last several years because it fits this like need for a deep planning high decision ranged um gameplay session without this crazy ramp up of like 45 hours of uh quest one two three four five to get there so it's it feels a it feels a role in my adult gaming life that, that i really like yeah i hear you there totally hear you there um <clears throat> are there any other are you excited about any upcoming projects we have a lot of projects right now on deck. We've had several games that have been fully complete uh, for about a year and a half now that we haven't released and mostly for lack of bandwidth for um, properly supporting all the marketing efforts. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're about to have like a, like a slew of awesome retro things that brand new announcements, brand new, brand new games that we're finally able to start talking about and start, start releasing. So I'm, Really excited by that. We have a couple of our internal projects that we're coming up on an announcement for. We have two projects that we've been actually living in for four years each, like a long time, Mm -hmm. uh, that we have some publishing uh, distribution partners on too. So lots of news coming from MegaCat in the next 60 days. Great. Um, And so we're running out of time here, but the, the last question I always ask everybody is, is there anything I should have asked you today, but I did not? Good question. How mm-hmm. do people normally answer that? Sometimes they freeze like a deer in the headlights and sometimes <laughs> they they think about it and sometimes they're just right on it. I don't know. Just... I guess it's like um, questions I wish you would have asked about. I mm-hmm. wish you would have asked about my joystick collection. Ooh. I have a pretty sick joystick collection. <laughs> let's, hear, let's hear about your joystick collection. Well, you know, it, it came to mind because are you familiar with the Cheetah joystick line? I don't know the Cheetah one, no. I'm going to have to send a couple live in the chat ops to check out. So Cheetah was a brand that made these third-party joysticks that work for a ton of uh, ton of retro game consoles mm-hmm. and all different uh, styles and types. They had some Batman and Alien vs. Predator. And I'll send you one of these um, in the Zoom chat for you to check out. So this is okay. the turtle joystick. And um, what I think is fun about this joystick hmm. and these, these joysticks specifically is when you hook these up, with top-down puzzle games like uh, Little Medusa and like uh, Ronio's Tale, even someone who's like a super pro is suddenly like deeply challenged by them. So right. a really great way to handicap uh, the folks who can speed run it in 15 minutes is to set them up with this turtle. That's funny. And I, we often have them at trade shows. They're usually hooked up at one of our TVs for people to play. And it's like uh, Probably one of my top two reasons to attend trade shows is watching people play like Marble Madness with one of these joysticks. Sure, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. One of my favorite things to do actually is um, if if I have somebody that's pretty good at a game and I'm good at the game, we take the same like NES controller and one of us controls the D pad oh, awesome. while the other do the buttons, and that is chaos for a while until you can really get <laughs> yeah. the teamwork down. So that's a fun little thing. I haven't right. tried that. That sounds like something uh, something I'd see some of the guys doing. Yeah. Yeah, we call it um, two dudes, one controller, usually. Like we, Very nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and then finally, uh, where can people find you online? So megacatstudios.com. And we are megacatstudios everywhere else. Discord, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. Anywhere you can find cat stuff, you can usually find us. All right. Fantastic. Uh, well, James, thanks for being here. Appreciate you coming on. Thanks for having us, Dan. Yeah. All right, man. Well, we'll talk later. All right, man. All right. Catch you later. See you. Bye. Bye.